Uh, hello everyone, it's um, nice to be here. Just a bit about myself, my name is Jake. I'm from the <laughs> University of Essex. I work under Boyd and Q and Terry McGenity. Some of you may recognize those names. And I have been invited to talk a little bit about the PhD work that I've been doing in collaboration with um, Oil Spill Response, with Rob Holland being one of my external supervisors. And this is going to focus on marine oil snow formation and the associated bacterial communities um, with a um, impacts of chemical dispersant use and the impacts of light. So with further ado, so why is this work important? Well, pretty much everybody here will know that oil production and consumption is not slowing down. We did have a bit of a dip due to COVID. However, we are getting back to those pre-COVID levels. Um, forecast to stay above 100 million barrels per day throughout the rest of 2023, going into 2024. And this obviously means that there is going to be a rise in the need of oil transportation, especially in regions where um, pipeline infrastructure may not be as good. So all in all, this means that the risk of oil spills is still a very prevalent problem today. So this is why we need to do work on the environmental impacts, um, work on remediation strategies such as chemical dispersants and how that may um, influence the environment itself. So first things first, what is marine snow? Well, marine snow is made up of the various organic and inorganic materials within the ocean, such as uh, phytoplankton, dead zooplankton, detritus, microalgae, bacteria, all of that stuff clumped together in an extracellular polymeric substance matrix. And marine snow is very important for specific processes in the ocean, such as um, providing much needed nutrients to deep sea benthic environments as it sinks through the water column. However, during spill events, um, the oil can integrate and get entrapped within these blocks, causing what we now know today as marine oil snow. And it was assumed that potentially marine oil snow may act as a vehicle for oil entering these deep sea environments. So how do chemical dispersants fit into this? Well, just a very quick background. We use dispersants to reduce the interfacial tension between oil and water, allowing the oil to disperse into the water column into tiny little droplets. This increases the surface area, thus bioavailability of the oil to hydrocarbon degrading bacteria, enhancing biodegradation. However, during the Deepwater Horizon incident in 2010, it was observed that there was a large abundance of marine oil snow forming within the region during the spill when dispersants were deployed. So they came to the conclusion or idea at least that maybe the use of dispersants had something to do with this enhanced formation of marine oil snow. And this may be quite detrimental because this could increase sedimentation on the benthos, which has various other environmental implications and it may increase the amount of oil entering these fragile ecosystems during the spill events. So what's the problem? Well, we have a lot of background knowledge on how marine oil snow forms, a lot of brilliant, fantastic papers that have um, gone through this process, showing us the implications of marine oil snow formation, how it interacts with its environment. However, there are still various things that we need to take into consideration. For example, with my research, sunlight. So why do we need to look into this? 
Well, unfortunately, even though we've got a lot of this really good solid groundwork done, a lot of these experiments and investigations have not really taken into consideration many of the environmental conditions that you might find during an in situ event. For example, in this case, sunlight opting to do a lot of their experiments and um, incubation of samples in complete darkness. So why is this important? Well, sunlight in um, oil itself, oil goes through a process known as photooxidation, where the chemical composition of the oil changes over time in the presence of oxygen and sunlight, notably UV rays. Um, this may have an onset influence on how the marine oil snow forms with the um, different components of oil integrating into it. And as well as this spectrum, light intensity and photo period have a major impact on phytoplanktonic communities, processes such as photosynthesis, and the various metabolites that these communities produce. And this influences heterotrophic communities, which include hydrocarbon degrading bacteria, thus may impact processes such as biodegradation within the marine oil snow itself, which over time, this may influence the formation and the structure itself of marine oil snow. Um, so this is something that we need to, to look into. Um, I had these the wrong way around, I apologize. <laughs> um, so how did I do this? Well, I created 500 milliliter microcosms using 400 milliliters of natural seawater collected from the North Sea, just off of Mersey Island, which is on the uh, coast of Essex and um, Suffolk. And I treated these with um, crude oil with and without the presence of chemical dispersants. These were placed on a roller table. There was some headspace left to allow for that uh, natural wave action, turbulence as they spun around. And this was just to sort of simulate a oil slick and then with the dispersant added and um, the effect of that oil dispersing into the water column. Half of my samples were put in complete darkness and the other half were put onto this day night cycle under a very, very powerful light that essentially mimicked what you would find within say the first five meters of the water column in the North Sea during springtime. So this was sort of the setup. You can see my bottles on the roller table, very powerful light. I wouldn't recommend looking directly into that thing. You would blind yourself. And then you can see as well in the bottles after a couple of days is when we started to see these little flocculants forming, which was really, really cool to see. So what did I find? Well, using various um, amplicon and sequencing techniques. We targeted the 16S RNA gene within bacteria, which allowed us to um, do analyses of bacterial abundance within the samples and then sequencing processes, which allowed us to actually look at the entire community as a whole. So first things first, this is the bacterial abundance of 16S RNA genes within my different treatments. Um, and you can see that the marino snow flocks essentially become what you would consider a <coughs> bacterial hotspot um, of activity as compared to the surrounding seawater of my samples. So I should say that I collected the marino snow and then also some of the surrounding seawater within the uh, microcosms. And even then you can also see that with the addition of oil, oil dispersant, there is a uh, significant increase in the abundance of this bacteria again. And this may indicate um, processes such as biodegradation occurring as within those treatments, they have had that additional carbon source given to them, which these hydrocarbon degraders 
um, like to uh, use for energy. So then when we look a little bit further at the community composition, you can see essentially here that between the marine oil snow plots and the surrounding seawater, these communities are massively different. This is a really, really nice NMDS plot. And you can also see that between the light and the dark treatments within the plots themselves, there are also very big differences within these communities. When you look a little bit further into this and you split it by treatments, you can see that these treatments with the oil and the dispersant between seawater, flocculants, light and dark are also showing these major differences, which indicates that within this experiment, the uh, presence of oil and the difference in light are the major drivers within these communities themselves, which is really fascinating to see. When we look at certain genera of interest, um, you can see that, for example, with uh, Philosophera, within the flocculants, they're, they're essentially attracted to these flocculants, especially flocculants with oil and dispersant rather than the surrounding seawater, suggesting that a lot of the oil did get entrapped within these um, essentially like micro habitats, which are the flocks. And you can also see that light had somewhat of an influence on their um, abundance themselves being significantly higher. But then you look at other species like uh, Arsinotobacter, and you can see that they do just fine in darkness. They, they seem to prefer it more than the light quite massively. And I mean, this isn't necessarily odd or strange because uh, hydrocarbon degrading bacteria is found all over the world um, as deep as the Mariana Trench. So there are um, genera that are more than happy to uh, thrive in dark environments, cold environments, hot environments, everything really. So that's quite nice to see. So you can start to get an idea of why it's important that we look at these um, microbial communities and the ecology behind marine oil snow, marine oil pollution in general, because this gives us a better idea of the biological processes that may be occurring, such as biodegradation. It is also important that we try to um, measure oil concentration, by like oil concentration analysis. Um, we are trying to do this. It has been quite difficult specifically for this experiment in terms of trying to sample the marine oil snow to see what the concentrations of oil getting entrapped with them is, as we used filter papers to capture them. And unfortunately, the filter papers we used did capture a lot of residual oil that was dispersed within the surrounding seawater. So we're going to try and workshop this, figure it out, see if we can get some nice oil concentration data from another experiment kind of like this. And you'd be able to sort of pop this data and information together to work out an even bigger scale story than this. But other than that, it's also very important that we try to physically look at how marine oil snow forms and the structures associated with it. So for this experiment, I tried to look at dry weight. Um, I, as I said, I filtered it onto a filter paper that was pre-weighed. Um, we used uh, free drying, freeze drying methods to uh, remove any of the water contexts to get the dry weight. And I mean, if you look at this at face value, it would suggest that, oh, marine snow is a natural phenomenon that happens anyway, even with the presence of oil and dispersion, it's not necessarily enhancing it. However, I do take this with a grain of salt because marine oil snow is very light. Um, it's quite hard to weigh. So we're also looking at different ways we can actually quantify this. Um, previous ways have gone for a chemical route, uh, looking at TEP, which is a type of exopolymeric substance as a proxy for um, marine oil snow formation. However, some of those methods 
uh, are a bit questionable as to whether they work well with dispersants and oil as their color metric. They <clears throat> influence the final outcome of those results. Others have been looking at carbohydrate contents, uh, protein, uronic acids with similar methods. However, it is a bit debatable as to whether they work well with dispersants or not. Other methods were um, physically counting them, measuring them, which was, seems quite tedious and prone to human error. But we're quite lucky that we have a um, imaging guy in our department who's very keen on trying to develop imaging methods to try and um, quantify uh, marine oil snow. So the way that we would do it is we get a laser, which is literally just one of those lasers that you can mount your shelves, check the measurements and stuff. And you get a phone or camera, put it above there. And as the laser goes through the top, the mid, the bottom part of the sample, you will end up with an image kind of like this. And so the laser reflects off of the flocks themselves. You can then put this image into software such as Image J, which will then allow you to quantify everything that has been reflected, get some potential abundance counts. And the reason that we did top, middle, and bottom is because we want to try and get some uh, comparisons between marine or snow that might be neutrally buoyant, positively buoyant, negatively buoyant, um, depending on uh, the oil and trapped into it, as oil is buoyant. So the more degradation that occurs over time, those flocks may become less buoyant and start to sink, and that might have um, implications to a uh, sinking velocity, which is also something that we could potentially look at. So just to finish off, we're also looking at maybe some high-res imaging of marine oil snow. Um, this is very early days, but the idea is, is that we could get these high-res um, images of the structure itself, and then you could potentially couple those with um, different probing techniques for bacteria to highlight the different communities within that flock. And these images can be 3D, so you can take an entire 3D model, highlight the bacterial communities with them, and you may be able to see stuff like if there is a, a noticeable oil droplet entrapped in that marine snow, you may be able to see various different bacteria surrounding it doing their whole thing. So um, thank you very much for listening. I am very happy to talk about my work in any of the networking sessions and if there's any questions I'll try my best to answer them. <laughs> uh, thank you Jake. Um, so this is a, a perfect example of how industries come together with, with academia to, to further the knowledge um, in, in this field and there, Jake has a fantastic uh, sort of advisory group and some of those individuals are in the room today, so Roger Prince, who's joined us all the way from the States, and Tom's on that advisory group, and Paul Shuler as well is on that advisory group. So Jake's getting uh, lots of uh, good uh, support from, from industry in his, in his PhD. And his PhD is funded by the UK government uh, with a small financial contribution from, from OSRL. Uh, but the majority of his funding comes from the UK government. I think it took Boy and I Three goes, three attempts to get that. So, um, <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. So, yes, thanks, Jay. So, any questions for Jay? <coughs> Thank you. I'm um, Jay from Memorial University, Canada. So, it's very interesting studies, and also congratulate because the uh, snow. You know, marine snow is very delicate, very easy to breathe, you know, it's, yeah, it's quite challenging process. Um, just a quick question. Um, did you measure the conditions when you do the experiment, for example, the temperature? Yes. You know? So I, I did actually forget to mention that. Um, so we had our 
all the tables. Um, when we collected the seawater, I did want to simulate as closely as possible to the conditions that were found in the North Sea upon collection. So the way we did that was uh, these roller tables are watertight. You can put water in them, allow the bottles to sit in that water, and you can control the water temperature via various means if you want it colder, warmer. So you always have that um, those bottles at the ambient temperature that you set. And so that's one way that we uh, did that. And also with the lighting system, uh, that was specifically programmed to have that spring time, UK time, day, night cycle. So you had the uh, sunrise and sunset were indicative of what was happening at the same time. Okay, yeah, because you're using our strong sun irradiation, well, yes, so control the temperature. So, yeah, um, that was one thing that if you didn't control the temperature because of the light, it would have got a lot hotter. It was very powerful. How about the nutrients and the oxygen? So, nutrients was the thing that we weren't that wasn't actually um dealt with in this experiment. As it, it started out as just a preliminary of can we actually do this with this technique? But then it turned into what it was with the uh, lighting and getting those results. Uh, but for future experiments, we are going to maintain nutrient concentrations um, to the level that was found upon sampling the seawater. So we have um, facilities and methods to do nutrient analysis. We'll do that on the seawater. And then throughout the experiments, we will, I will like keep ma maintaining the nutrient concentration every few days within those bottles um, over how, however long the experiment is. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, so just introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi there, uh, Mark Kirby, uh, Synapse. Um, thank you, that's really interesting, personally. Um, I was just interested in, obviously you were measuring uh, olefilic bacteria, yes. uh, particularly. Um, was there an impact, or did you measure any other uh, other bacterial community, yes, um, and and do they contribute to snow? And were they impacted by the toxicity of the oil? And also, obviously, we know oil components were to be phototoxic. Yeah, you know, yeah. So there's quite a few different other elements. There. A lot. Yeah. Um, um, that might have so been the methods that we use, which is the amplicon sequencing, sequences the entire community. So you are going to get other um, bacterial genera, bacterial strains that aren't hydrocarbon degraders, um, and you can measure those. So what I do is when I get that data is I essentially just sieve through it to see what's actually interesting, what's, because there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of different bacteria in those samples, so you do need to try and pinpoint, oh, that's quite high in abundance in a, this sample compared to, say, um, treatments that didn't have oil or in um, the seawater only controls, maybe there's uh, bacteria that's more highly abundant there that has obviously been impacted by the uh, presence of oil. So this is something that we can look at and report on if it shows anything interesting really so then you can talk about the certain implications of the toxicity of oil itself and how that's influenced certain bacteria or how has the presence of chemical dispersant influenced hydrocarbon degraders and even bacteria that isn't a hydrocarbon degrader has it had an impact on that um so yeah you, you can do all that with the methods that we're doing just takes a while to sit through everything. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so we'll move swiftly on. Thank you very much again. Thank you.